Welcome to the Good Fight Radio Show, a program dedicated to bringing you vital and uncompromised truths that you won't hear in the mainstream media, discussing contemporary issues in light of the Bible and how these issues relate to family, culture, and the church. The heart of this show is to glorify Jesus Christ and expose the works of darkness as He is commanded in Ephesians 5.11. Now here's your host, Good Fight Ministries' own Chad Davidson. Welcome back to the Good Fight Radio Show. I'm your host, Chad Davidson of Good Fight Ministries. And with me, as always, is the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. How are we doing today? Give me thanks to Jesus, brother. Praise the Lord. We heard you say hi earlier, too. But <laughs> with us as well, Amen. as always, is the show's producer, Tony Palacio. How are you doing today, bro? Praising the Lord. Well, praise God. Just so you know, last week, you guys might have heard also at the end of an episode, or maybe it was two weeks ago, uh, Tony's oh, yeah. wife actually came in clapping at the end of an episode. That so was sometimes Thursday's show. We yeah. make some noise here. Uh, <laughs> on the 1619 Project, I think it was. Yes, on the 1619 Project. She came in to pick Was she happy up. we're done, or was she happy about a point was made? <laughs> I think both, both, I think. I think. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> she, she's been getting into all these topics, you know, research and stuff online. So when she came in and heard us talking about something that she had been studying and our perspective on it, she was in total agreement. She was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Yeah, praise God, man. And it is cool. And I, and I love seeing people excited about these topics. And I love seeing that people get excited about Typology Tuesday, which we're going to be on today once again. And as you guys know, we, we deal with a number of subjects, but this is one of those things that we get to always come back to. When, you know, Joe will come and say, hey, I, we got to do two parts on this show. Like last week, can the elect be deceived? That's important enough that we can say no and then yes, they can be deceived, right? So no, that text is being used the wrong way. And yes, this is how they can be deceived, the mm-hmm. second part. And so whenever something comes up, typically Typology Tuesday is the one that gets pushed back to the next week because it's something that Joe can always study deep here, deeper and bring. And I hope you guys have been blessed by this. And over the last... Man, how long have we been doing these shows now? What, over I, I'm over thinking, a year. Well, I know over a year for a Good Fight Radio show, but probably just close to over a year or close to a year when it comes to Typology oh, Tuesday yeah. as Definitely. well, when Joe came up with the idea of having it every Tuesday for you guys. So you guys have had a number of teachings covering different topics, and we are only in verse 15 of Genesis <laughs> chapter 1. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and that's great, and that's what's so awesome about the well, word of God. We're all over the scripture. We're jumping all around, but yeah, amen. Yeah, amen. And that, that's exactly right. We talk about exegesis. Well, this is stringing it out as best we can, right? And <laughs> when it when we look at this and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as we've looked at very, very clearly and, and see the connection of light coming out of the darkness and Paul referencing the creative order when it comes to specifically our new creation and the gospel message, mm-hmm. and you just see it over and over again. And then for the last week or so, I guess, covering the fact festivals and covering these verses, we've talked a lot about specifically festivals. And I'm going to read Genesis 1, 14 through 15 before we really get into this specific teaching. But just to give somewhat of a recap, because it has been two weeks since we talked about it. So hopefully you guys will dig in with us. Genesis 1, verse 14 Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for, remember, seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. It's always so when God says it. So with that said, seasons there, as Joe has uh, made quite clear, is that word there, that Hebrew word word being used for seasons is also used for festivals and as we look so in fact it's always used it's for always festivals, used for festivals. Crazy. yeah that's right in a good way and so when we look at it and then we also put that together with what the new testament says in colossians chapter 2 specifically dealing with sabbaths and dealing festivals. with festivals i i think it's Pretty cool that we get to dig in like this, see this clear parallel, and see that God's hand was showing forth his gospel message from Genesis. So clear. We always talk about the proto-evangelium, right? A lot of people in in Christianity talk about in Genesis chapter 3, where you see the seed of the woman stepping on the the bruising of the heel over the serpent's head, right? So we see that proto-evangelium, that first gospel, but really... We're seeing it here. We're yeah. so clearly... Over and over and over again in Genesis 1. <laughs> yeah. And Chad's point is when yeah. people say, we're the first gospel presentation, what do you first see, the, you know, a pointer from God to the gospel? 
they'll say, ah, oh, the, you know, if they, they're in the theology, almost everyone will say, if they know, they'll say the Proto-Evangelium in Genesis 3, 15, 16. Yep. Right there, the, Chad just mentioned it. And no, I shake my head. No, it's actually the very first two verses of Genesis. Now we're in verses 14 and 15, and we've been seeing the gospel in Genesis for, I mean, almost a year. I, we, actually over a year, but it's actually a little bit under because we've skipped some messages yeah, yeah, on yeah, Tuesdays, yeah, you know. Sure. But it's amazing, and be, it's dangerous to pray sometimes because, I mean, that in a good way. And I said, Lord, because uh, there's things we're getting into. I had no idea I was going to be going through the seven feast days when I hit these verses. But you know what? Looking at the text and, and crying out to the Lord and, and saying, Lord, show open the eyes of your servant that you might show us beautiful things from your word. That's what oh, Dave, that's that, a great Psalm 119, right? Amen. And then all of a sudden, I'm sorry, man. I'm looking at the most some of the, a lot of the modern translations and the modern scholarship on these two verses and how... It's it's the, the evidence is overwhelming. The the meaning of that word throughout this should have been caught on a long time ago. It's festivals, and he is to Moses giving him that showing him that creation was made to mark the festivals, the seventh festival is the number of completion that you will have, and all those festivals, as we know, Chad, you already alluded to in Col Colossians chapter two. Let no one judge you according to Sabbath. They are festival. These are shadows that point to what, but the reality he says is in Jesus. The substance, These festivals yeah. all yeah, point right. to Jesus. All seven festivals in chronological order show, in chronological order, the gospel and the story of redemption. And we already looked at Passover. And I think if you asked what would be the goal of teaching this, I think some of it, for me even, listening and learning as I sit here as well, talking about these things and meditating on these things, it's the mind renewed that when we look at God's creative order and we recognize that our God is a God of order, He's not a God of chaos, and you see, he didn't do these things by accident. It was all showing forth for ultimately what would happen at the cross. That's why we always bring up the cross. That's why we always bring up the gospel. That's why if you're preaching a message and don't get to Jesus, go just go home, right? <laughs> like you need to go and preach Jesus. And especially when you see it so clearly and see that God didn't create it in this way on accident. Yeah, amen, bro. It's on purpose. Absolutely. And that's such an important point. In fact, uh, some of the scholarly work I've read on uh, this word meaning festivals, and I'm thinking this is actually a third one we've done on the festivals in regard to because we had a, more of an introductory kind of looking more at the text, you know. And then last time we looked at Passover as a picture of Christ's sacrifice for us, and then this one we'll be looking at the second feast and how it falls right in order chronologically according to the, what happened next with Jesus. But as I'm looking at the scholarly work on how this should be translated festival or its best translation, uh, nowhere I've seen a scholarly work do they extrapolate and say what this means. <laughs> They're just saying, hey, this means festival. Yeah, but let's go on. What's the point? Why is God giving this to Moses, you know? And I'm not saying people haven't seen the connection. I'm sure they have, but it's mind boggling. You look at it, you're like, wow, we've been pointing out from Genesis 1, the first couple verses, that when he made everything tohu wabohu, darkness, void, you know, empty, it was all a picture of what? You know, how we were before we were born again. Then the light comes, let there be light. We're born again. Paul quotes that passage or he alludes to it in 2 Corinthians 4 and says this picture of what God's done in you. These are all types and pictures of redemption. But the feast days point to Jesus. And what we want to look at now, guys, is we're looking at the seven feast days. And we've looked at the first one already, Passover. In Leviticus chapter 23, God gives them in a chronological order seven specific feast days that they're to practice. Now, some of these feast days are connected to other feast days, which will kind of, you know, I'll get into a little bit as we go on. But the first feast day, which marked the beginning of their new year, I'm not talking about their civil new year, but their their spiritual calendar uh, in Nisan was a was Passover on the 14th of that month. You would celebrate Passover. And last week, just brothers off the top of your head, what were some of the kinds of things that we looked at that took place in the Passover that pointed to Jesus? Well, the Passover, you have the blood being put in the form of a cross on their doorpost in their you, lintel right the afikomen the... yeah you have the testing of the unblemished lamb as well for five days for five you have days. to look at it make sure it's mm -hmm. unblemished why is that significant because they what happened they to jesus? tested jesus That's for what five you days see. in for jerusalem he goes in, in there and they check him out and they can't find any sin in him you know and they and they're all rise up and say kill it kill it israel rise up and says crucify yeah. him crucify and him here's a good one what day did jesus get crucified on Friday. Mm -hmm. Passover. Passover day. Right. Yeah, Passover, Passover day. day. I mean, and, these, and you know, he's a male lamb and all these different things. Uh, he's a lamb of God that takes away sins of the world, all these prophecies of the Old Testament that he'd be like a, a sheep before his shearers and, and you know, John the Baptist, behold, the lamb of God that takes away sins of the world. That's why we believe in the penal substitutionary atonement. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, they were substituted for the firstborn. And then Amen. Paul, of course, 
puts the exclamation point on it, just like he does in Second Corinthians four. Four, I said five. Tohu earlier. wabohu. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you I know said what you that. meant. But with <laughs> regard to uh, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed for us, right? He says it straight out. I think it's five seven. First Corinthians five seven, where he says that. Now it's interesting. The first feast was Passover, but guess what would happen the next day? Because there would be a whole week. And sometimes they just call, later on in Jewish history, they would call it the Feast of Unleavened Bread, even though it would begin with the Feast of Passover, the first day. Then on the 15th of that same month, they would then practice unleavened bread, right on the heels of the Passover. Why? And what significance does this have with Jesus? How does this fit in typology? What was it foreshadowing regard, regarding the gospel and Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, if anything? Well, a whole lot. But guess what? When I was working on this, the first eight or 10 pages I typed out, I was like, it had more to do with the application to us before I was really into the application of Jesus because I just went on a roll. And I said, you know what? <laughs> then I started getting the application of Jesus and really how it's fulfilled in Christ, which is what I really wanted to focus on. I thought, man, I'm not gonna get into any other stuff. Maybe I'll hint toward it. And that's gonna be another message because the application to us in the Feast of Eleven Bread and how it relates to us and Christ's Passover and our walks with Jesus is pretty profound. But right now we want to see how is it fulfilled in Christ. And in Leviticus chapter 23, verses 6 through 8, he says that on the 15th day, and this would be the day subsequent to the Passover, on the 15th day of the same month, there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation, and you shall not do any laborious work. But for seven days you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. So it's important to understand here that during these seven days, they're supposed to go through their house and look for leaven. And leaven would be, you know, the aspect of the bread that would cause bread to, you know, to basically blow up yeast or what have you. And it's basically a decaying process, you know, and a fermenting process. And leaven was a picture and we're going to see this really clearly in the scripture, a picture of sin, okay? Mm-hmm. It's also a picture of false teaching, as we'll see, and the next message on this. But it's mm-hmm. definitely a picture of sin and false teaching, and they're to get all the leaven out of their houses for seven days. Today, Jews still practice. Observant Jews will take a broom and a dustpan and look for any breadcrumbs of bread that has had leaven in it and has puffed up and so forth, where the dough has risen, and they'll get rid of it. And they were to do this for seven days it was a picture of bread being unleavened or getting all the leaven out of their houses. And when they were to practice the Passover service, remember, they were using unleavened bread, okay? Because leaven is a picture of sin. And Christ, our Passover lamb, was crucified for us, but he's also the bread from heaven. And he's without sin, which kind of hints where we're going with this. But if you did not get all the leaven out of your house, or you didn't take it seriously, and you used, and there was leaven in your bread, and all of a sudden, you, you know, oh, wow, this guy's got a big old piece of sourdough it looks like here you know and uh which by the way leaven makes your bread really really to the point of so sour and contaminated it becomes like putrid and sick can't even eat it uh when it gets really you know going there anyway listen to what it says in exodus twelve fifteen: whosoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day that's of this unleavened bread week that soul shall be cut off from israel tell me god isn't taking this seriously <laughs> you would be put to death it's a capital crime not to get rid of the leaven out of your house. So he took this very seriously. But the typological fulfillment of this, this holiday foreshadows something absolutely mind-boggling. And I hope you guys remember this. I hope you could take someone through the feast and say, well, this is Jesus in the Passover. I had a, a really neat sister, newer in the Lord, uh, been coming to Blessed Hope for a little while now. This is quite a ways away. She, she makes it, but uh, she was just telling me recently, I just ran into her and, and we're chatting and at a, my, my sister's house, and she's like, you know what, I was, she was all excited. She goes, I was reading, this, we're going through, me and a friend of mine that's also a Christian, we're reading a passage, going through the Old Testament, and we had a passage, and I said, oh, there's Jesus. And the, the friend goes, what do you mean there's Jesus? She goes, that's a picture, that's a shadow of Jesus. And she begins to explain the picture of Jesus in the Old Testament to her. Mm-hmm. And the gal's out, got eyes were like bugging out. She's like, wow, that is the picture of Jesus. How do you find that? Where did you? And she started to tell her about the show, you know? And she said, you know what? And she's a newer sister and she got, she's so excited about Typology Tuesdays because wow. she loves Jesus. And she goes, she goes, I've been seeing Jesus all over the Old Testament now, you know? 
And by the way, we're looking at Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, but we're also in Leviticus chapter 23. We're in Exodus chapter 15 already. We're all over the scripture. 2 so Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. <laughs> <laughs> Got the right one that well. time. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. So it's it's a picture of sin because leaven, it's you know, make, ferments the bread or it's a fermentation. It's a decay actually is what's going on there. It's a contaminant, you know, and it affects the bread, makes it sour, as I said. In fact, it's basically it spreads silently, but very strongly. It's like sin. Sin could spread silently, but very strongly. And just like sin puffs up bread, or I should say leaven does, sin puffs. It doesn't change the weight of the bread. It just makes it mm. seem different, you know, and tastes different. And it changes the condition, but just as it changes the condition of people, sin does. And, and the opinions and their thoughts and so forth. Listen to how Paul referred to leaven in connection with the Passover and the day or the week of unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. In First Corinthians chapter five, he's dealing with the fornicator, you know, the guy that's you know having sexual relations with his father's wife. Paul says, and he says that he's they need to excommunicate this guy. They need to have him leave the fellowship, and if he repents, he could come back. That happens in Second Corinthians. We read about that in chapter two. But Paul says to these guys, these Corinthians, who are in a very libertine church, basically there were some grace changers in the leadership there who were teaching that you can live a life of practicing sin and still be right with God, enter the kingdom of God. Paul refutes that and says, no, you're not. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God in chapter 6. But in chapter 5, he says that they need to have this guy leave who, who's having sex with his mom. Your boasting, he says, is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Just a little bit. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of, this is what he calls leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Isn't that amazing? So leaven is akin to or a picture of malice, wickedness, where the unleavened bread is a picture of being without leaven, sincerity, and truth, guys. And by the way, there's a few different times Jesus talks about the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Sadducees, the leaven of Herod, which we'll get into when we look at what different what leaven represents. Pretty heavy, heavy studies when you think about it. Because then you can go to those texts and say, ah, this is all connected to Jesus. It's all connected to the gospel. It's all connected to what he wants to do in our hearts and our lives. And, and the whole Bible becomes bigger and bigger and bigger it's smaller and smaller and smaller. And what I mean is it becomes so like mind-blowing. So like, wow, it's so huge. All these things are so big and what God's doing. But also you're able to link things together and say, wow. And it just gives, gives you a better understanding of the scripture as a whole. And that's what I mean by smaller. I mean, you can get around the block easier and appreciate the Lord and what he's doing more. So it's interesting. Uh, we have this picture going on. And now on Passover, they were to use unleavened bread and the Feast of Unleavened Bread for the next week, there's to make sure they got every little piece of leaven out of their house. So it's interesting, when we think of Passover, we think of unleavened bread, when the Jews practice Passover to this day, you guys have practiced several times with us here at Blessed Hope. Yeah. Uh, several years we've done the uh, the Passover, Christ in the Passover. Mm -hmm. You know, Jack Haynes has done it several times. I've done it before with a, a different pastors. And uh, my favorite part, and I was able, I think I mentioned this on one of these shows, mm -hmm. even in the past, where it was I was able to do the unleavened bread part, the afikoman, where you have the three pieces of bread, you know? Mm -hmm. And this is what Jews practice to this day. If you go to a Jewish Passover, they will take an afikoman. These folks do not know Jesus. They'll take an afikoman, a piece of cloth with three chambers in it. And each chamber will have a big piece of unleavened bread, matzah, a matzah cracker. And there'll be one, two, and three. And they'll take the middle one out. And then they'll break the middle one. And then they'll wrap it in linen cloth. By the way, does this sound familiar? Very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds familiar because it's a powerful picture of what happened with Jesus. Yep. And I actually called the rabbi before I did my part in a, the first time I participated in a Passover, a Christ in the Passover. And I think it was Marty Getz was singing at that. And I was with a few other pastors. And I wanted to be humble because everybody was like, what part do you want? Everybody's like, I want to be, I want to go through the 10 plagues. I want to go. I'm not just like, just sit back and... Let it fall wherever it falls, Joe. Just accept it. And they said, "I guess you're doing uh, <laughs> the uh, the afikoman." I go, "Thank you, Jesus." I go, "That's actually what I wanted." Praise the Lord, because you hold that afikoman up. I called the rabbi, and uh, I asked the rabbi, "What does it signify to you?" You know, and 
he was like, well, we don't really know. Well, of course they don't really know. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't be a rabbi unless he was messianic, right? He goes, well, one of the ideas is it represents Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like, I have no problem with the second one representing Isaac to you, because then I went into the whole Isaac typology. Mm-hmm. Only begotten son, the father loved, Abraham loved, took about Moriah where Jesus was crucified, and a lamb was sacrificed in his stead, and he's a picture of Christ. Beautiful. We'll get you know? to that in five years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Genesis chapter 19, you know. Yeah. In fact, I think we did have that one of those already. Yeah, we did. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, so what happens is I'm talking to him, and then I, was, I used this opportunity to preach the gospel to him. Amen. I said, we look at it as Jesus, you know. And I told him, and this is what I did in the Passover service, and this is what happens if you go see Christ in the Passover. Whoever's doing the afikoman, you know, and if you have one person doing it, uh, they'll emphasize three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the second one is taken out. They hold it up. Jesus, Father, Son. Jesus represents the second one, Son. He comes to earth. They break it. Jesus was broken for our sins. They wrap it in linen. He was buried. Then what happens? The highlight of the Passover service for a lot of people is when the kids go looking for it, whoever resurrects it, whoever brings it up from being buried, they bury it somewhere. They literally hide it somewhere. That's the joy. They found it, you know? They get a prize. They get a prize. Well, it's that piece of bread at Passover. Jesus took that unleavened piece of bread and said, this is my body. I think that's yeah. so <laughs> profound. Yeah. And by the way, yeah. when you hold up that unleavened bread, it's pierced. It's got these holes in it. He's pierced for our sin. Amen. It's bruised. Looking, he was bruised for our iniquities. It's striped. By his stripes, we are healed. That's all in Isaiah 53. Bruised, pierced, striped. And guess what? It's unleavened. He's without sin. Amen. So all this is really, really profound when you think about it. So when Jesus gave communion, the first communion service, which was an abbreviated Passover service, the night before Passover, because the next day he'd be crucified, and they celebrated the night before with his apostles, he told them that this is my body of the bread, which is given for you, Luke chapter 22, verse 19. This is my body, which is given for you. What's your body? This unleavened bread is a picture of his body given for them, you know. And they were commanded in Exodus 13, 7, no unleavened bread should be seen in, uh, with you or in your quarters or in all your coasts for seven days. Deuteronomy 16, 4 as well. That's where it talks about the coast. Now, it's interesting. Uh, when we look at this, we know it was unleavened bread because they're selling bread in the Passover service and it was considered, you'd be cut off, you know. If you had leavened bread, even, and by, by the way, it, it, it kind of saddens my heart. I don't condemn them. I don't break fellowship over this. But a lot of we, a lot of people do not use unleavened bread when they do communion. Yeah, yeah, a lot of Presbyterians, good. Presbyterians as a whole, I think I could be wrong on that. You literally uh, see a loaf up there. Yeah. The Reformers, <laughs> so uh, a lot of the Calvinists, uh, Charles Hodge, one of the top Calvinist writers, admits in his commentary, Matthew 26, 26, he says, it is said as they were eating, during the repast, Jesus broke, took bread. That is, he took of the bread lying on the table. And as it was the time of the Passover, there is no doubt that the bread used was unleavened. It was the thin Passover bread of the Jews. He's right. I agree with that. Unfortunately, just a couple of sentences later, he says, it is evidently a matter of indifference what kind of bread is used, though. So I'm like, what in the world? Now, guess what? We don't have a command, thou shalt use unleavened bread in communion. So it's not something we divide over. It's not some because it's more of an example. But praise the Lord. This is where typology, right? And uh, the customs of the Jews and the pictures of, of leaven being a sin inform you in your practice, you know? Not to the where you make it a divisive doctrine, but hey, since this is what Jesus used, we ought to use it. And since there's great uh, typological significance and great historical significance and it's a great significance with regard to Jesus being sinless and we're showing his body that he's sinless we're taking it in remembrance of him and because of a sinless sacrifice that we're justified I think it makes full sense to use unleavened bread although I don't condemn someone in our church that doesn't so Passover what does Passover typify the Passover we've already looked at it it shows forth his what his death on the cross for our sins his sacrificial death for our cross for us on the cross. What does the unleavened bread of Jesus picture? What does a feast of unleavened bread show forth? It shows Jesus' burial. His body was laid in the tomb. He was buried. So right after he was crucified, Passover, right? His body was buried. What would happen the next day? You know, the unleavened bread would all be taken out of the Jewish homes and so forth. But it's interesting. When you read 
Isaiah 53, you read about surely our griefs, it's the Old Testament, that he's our Passover lamb. Surely our griefs, the Old Testament prophecy, we use this when we witness the Jews. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, but he has, was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him like a lamb that has led to slaughter. He's like a sheep as silent before shears. He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, but the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. That's just amazing. It's so clearly Jesus. But verse 9, which I skipped, deals with his burial. And that's interesting. When it deals with his burial, it emphasizes his sinlessness, even as the Afikoman bread is buried and it's without leaven. His grave was assigned with wicked men. He was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Did you guys ever wonder why it says he was a rich with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence? Think about that. And I'm talking to the audience too. Have you ever thought about why it says because of uh, he's he buried with a rich man in his death? I'm sorry, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence. It connects him being buried in a rich man's tomb with because he did no violence. This is important to understand. How would a criminal, do you guys know how a criminal would be put, to, how he'd be buried if he was crucified on a cross? He wasn't given a burial. No. Yeah. What, what, was that? what would happen, they would Chad? throw him into like a ditch. Yeah, they'd throw him in a ditch or throw him <laughs> in the Valley of Hinnom, without no Gehenna, their, yeah. without burial and everything. Not so with Jesus. Mm -mm. Because guess, guess what? When he died on the cross, it said to tell us die, the, he paid for our sin in full. Okay? That way his body, guess what? He's, the sin's already paid for. His body does not have to see corruption because there's no what in it? No sin, no there's leaven. There's no leaven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you're able to resurrect it and say, hey, it's still without leaven, which happens at the Jewish Passover. And that's why Genesis 3.19, which was the divine curse on the sin of Adam and Eve, uh, by uh, uh, to, uh, it says, till you return to the ground, because from it uh, you were taken, for you are dust, and dust you shall return. Guess what? He never had to return to dust. His body never decomposed. In, in fact, Peter says, David says, he quotes Psalm 16, a prophecy of Jesus. I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will, will live in hope, because you will not abandon your, my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. It's pretty heavy, because... Peter goes, brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he has both died and buried and the tomb is with us to this day. But he goes on to point out that this refers to the Lord Jesus Christ because his body never did see decay. The grave could not hold him. What's the point here? Is the Passover service represents Christ's death, his sacrifice. The Feast of Unleavened Bread represents his burial and that he basically uh, <laughs> Uh, was without sin. And the fact that when he rose again, Paul says he rose for our justification. In other words, guess what? The fact that he rose from the dead showed that he was without sin and there was no leaven in him. And his body never saw decay. Praise the Lord. Amen. You've been listening to the Good Fight Radio Show brought to you by Good Fight Ministries. If you're blessed by this show and would like to partner with us, won't you consider visiting our support page at goodfight.org? Or you can write to us at P.O. Box 2202, Simi Valley, California, 93062, or call us toll-free at 1-866-JC-TRUTH. That's 1-866-528-7884. We hope you'll tune in next time on the Good Fight Radio Show.